This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, I invite you now to join with me in our morning's call to worship using the words printed in your bulletin. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. As we knock, open the door to us. I invite you all to stand as you are able and join together in singing our opening hymn of the morning, hymn 446, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, though you are known by many names and depicted in many ways, we know you most fully in Jesus Christ, our Messiah, your Son. We thank you for forming us into the church, the body of Christ in the world. Help us to live as he taught us, loving you, loving neighbor, unified in Christ, using our varied gifts and skills in service of ministry until all things are transformed into what is good and acceptable and perfect in your sight. We pray in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to greet those sitting around you at the peace of Christ. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to see you here on this uh, late summer Sunday morning. We're thankful for your presence among us. If you're a visitor with us today, we want to say a word of special welcome to you. We're glad that you are here, whether by invitation of a, a family member or a neighbor, or whether you're here simply uh, looking for a place to, to call home, a place to worship on Sunday mornings. We're glad that you have found us. And would ask those seated toward the center aisle uh, on, in this section to begin to pass down and back up again uh, your respective pew, the Ritual of Friendship pad, and uh, that you might give us your name. If you're a visitor, we would love to have some additional way of being in touch with you. Some sort of uh, contact information would be wonderful to have, but we're glad, again, that you're here. A uh, couple of things to... Uh, speak to uh, the life of the church. I want to thank, first of all, our woodwind trio uh, comprised of Lydia Breer and Michael Bolick and Dr. Lee Barrow that, bringing us the gifts of music this morning. We are thankful for them sharing their gifts and, of course, for our choir and their ministry to us as well. A couple of other things uh, to, to uh, lift up for your consideration. First of all, we will uh, be conducting, uh, conducting, we will be undergoing a time of taking pictures for uh, the church directory, the pictorial church directory. It's been a few years since last we did one of those uh, uh, bulletins, and so I want to uh, be able to, to give uh, you one of those in the fall, of, late fall of the year, perhaps early next year by the time they finally get uh, printed and back to us. But in the meantime, we'll take the pictures in October, and all of those dates are listed there in your bulletin. There's an opportunity for you uh, at the table outside to, uh, to sign up for that, or you can go online and sign up uh, yourself if you'd like to, to do it that way as well. But we hope that we'll get as near 100% uh, participation rate is absolutely possible because it's really a good way for you to get to know other members of the church and for them to get to know you as well and put names and faces together. So please make every effort to uh, attend one of those photo dates uh, that are upcoming in October. Welcome class will begin to be offered on September the 17th, the September 17th, 24th and October 1st. Uh, at 9.45, the Sunday school hour, each of those uh, three Sundays in the church parlor. If you're a visitor with us, you'd like to know more about the Presbyterian Church in general or Buford Presbyterian Church more in particular, it's a really good opportunity to learn some more about the church, some of the things that we believe, some of the ways and means of our congregation, and the things going on here in the life of the church. So I would uh, commend that uh, particular class to you coming up on September 17th. Also, uh, Joanna Barrow, our new Children's Choir Director will be registering uh, again out in the Narthex following the service this morning. So if there are children interested in children's choirs who haven't yet registered or pre-registered, it is for kindergartners uh, going up uh, through the uh, sixth grade. So please be mindful of that and, and go and, and meet Joanna and put your name down. She would love to meet uh, parents and interested children. So that will be happening just after our service. We won't do that next weekend with the Labor Day uh, weekend uh, upon us, but that will begin in earnest in two weeks' time on Rally Day. So really two weeks from today, our Sunday school program will kick off uh, yet again, youth programs, children's choirs, and the like. So be mindful of that date also. Tuesday night Bible study is beginning again on September the 5th. Information about that in your bulletin home, hosted uh, for the first meeting at the home of Christine Neldon. So information about that is in your bulletin too. And the Wednesday Bible study continues to meet 10 o'clock every Wednesday morning here at the church. We are currently studying uh, the Genesis chapters uh, 37 through 50, the stories of Joseph in the Old Testament. So come if you're available to be a, a part of that as well. I would personally, I teach that class and would invite you to come along and be a part of that. Are there other announcements that, that need to be made? today pertaining to the life of the church. Let us continue to worship the Lord together.
For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These words of Paul remind us that nothing, no sin, no transgression is too great to be redeemed. And so before God and with the people of God, let us now confess our sins together. Faithful and loving God, we confess that we have not lived in faith and love. You claim us as your own people, but we forsake your holy covenant. You offer us the gift of prayer, but we forget to lift our hearts to you. Forgive us, God of grace. Help us to live our lives in Christ, rooted and grounded in our faith, and growing each day in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God and amen. You may be seated.
this time, I'd like to invite our children forward for our children's sermon this morning with Sandra Henderson. Good morning. How are you? Hey, way over there. <laughs> Today, Pastor Corey's sermon is going to be about the development of the Christian church from the very early days. And in, in that, we mean the development of the people in the church, not the church building itself, okay? Um, <clears throat> it, Jesus kind of introduced the idea to his disciples when he was walking with them one day, and he said, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Isaiah, Jeremiah, or another prophet. Um, and then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter spoke right up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus recognized right then that he had a strong foundation for his church. And he said, and I say to you, Peter, you... Or the found, I will build, you are the rock upon which I'll build my church. Now, why do you think he used a rock as an example? You are the rock upon which I'll build my church. Any ideas? A rock is strong, right? It's heavy and strong and dense. And so he was talking about two things. He was talking about Peter would, would, could build a good foundation for his people church. And also that Peter was a good, strong believer and that he would be able to lead the church and teach other people about Christ and as they developed the church. So, today I'm going to give you a rock to remind you um, of what we're talking about. And you can just keep that rock and save it for yourself and to remind you that we have a, a church with a strong foundation in it or you can do a, something a little more adventurous. Um, when I give you the rocks, um, you can take it with you and maybe paint something on it. You could paint something like, this is one that my granddaughter gave me. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Um, but, but it was something that made me feel special when she gave it to me. Another way you can do it, and I'm sure some of your parents already know about it because just about every state in the country and, and every city I've tried to look up has a, like, Swanee Rocks or Buford Rocks group on Facebook. So your parents could go to their Facebook page and um, search for Buford Rocks or Swanee Rocks or Flowery Branch Rocks. All of those have sites. I looked them up. Um, I looked up some in Florida when we were down there because my granddaughter left rocks all over the beach area that we were at this summer for people to find. And some of them were, had religious things on them and some didn't. But you can say things like just a, a Bible verse uh, or just a saying like God loves me or God loves you if you're giving it to somebody else. Or it might, uh, you might paint a, a lit uh, oil lamp or a cross or any picture that remind people of, of Christ and just say something about God loves you or something on it. Um, on the back of that rock, though, if um, you could also write um, Swanee Rocks or whatever town you're from and, they, and take a picture of the rock where you put it, if you put it in a store, for instance, or if you put it in a park, uh, you could take a picture of it and your parents could post that on the, the, your town's rock group. And they would be able to see your rock and, and have an idea and you'd give them a clue where you hit it. And also, if you were to find a rock, that person who finds it would take a picture of it and says, oh, look what I found. Thank you for my rock. And they'd put a picture of your rock on there. So people can see that and share. You might not even know that person. may never see them again, but you will have shared with them something about Jesus Christ if you do something that, that has a, a, a Christian saying or picture on it. Um, I, I hope you'll do something adventurous with it. If you want to just keep it, that's fine. If you want to paint something and keep it or, or paint something and give it to some of your family members or a friend, that would be fine. Okay? 
So I'm going, I'm, first of all, I'm going to, say, let's say the prayer first, and then I'll give you your rocks when you start to leave. <laughs> Would you repeat after me, please? Dear God, Dear God help us to be part of the rock foundation on which your son has built his church so that the church will be forever strong. Amen. for our second hymn uh, will be Fairest Lord Jesus, which is 306. I'll announce these again in just a minute. Um, and Come to the Lakeshore, hymn 377. What? What did you say? Let us pray together. God of grace and mercy, you spoke and called the world into being. You moved over the waters and calmed the chaos. You created and called all that you had made good. Speak again this day, we pray, reminding us of the calling and the purpose you intend for this world and for those of us who live in it. Move again this day, we pray, calming the chaos of our lives and of the broken world in which we live. Create again this day, we pray, redeeming your creation and reminding us of the new life that is possible because of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Almighty God, on this day, we pray for all the broken places in our lives and in our world. We pray for those who are ill, injured, who are in the hospital and in need of your healing. Heal them and strengthen them, we pray, that they might know of your healing power in their lives. For those who mourn and grieve the loss of loved ones, the loss of possibility, the loss of a future, remind them that they do not walk alone. Remind them of your hope and of your future. For those in the path of Hurricane Harvey, now Tropical Storm Harvey, protect them, O oh God. Keep them safe and give them the strength and the courage that they need to endure the days ahead. Be with them as they begin the process of rebuilding and recovering and help us to be a part of that as well. For places in this world, O oh God, where unrest has been all too real, for Charlottesville, for Barcelona, for the continued conflict in North Korea, we pray your peace. Too often, O oh God, the realities of this world are unbearable and often overwhelming. Everywhere we look, there is chaos and brokenness, discord and disagreement, hatred and violence, greed and power-mongering. 
silence within us and within the world, our me-first attitudes, the vitriolic speech that leads to violence, the deafening drumbeat of war. Help us and all of your people to learn your justice, to learn your way of peace and your mercy, and to practice it in our daily lives. Like Peter, we confess that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Help us to profess this truth in our words and in our actions. Help us to trust that you still move in this world, calling us to continue to build up your body of Christ, the church. Help us to join in the work that you call us to, helping you to reconcile this world to you. We do believe, O oh God. Help our unbelief. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 124. I invite you all to listen now for God's word speaking to us this day. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we'll sing the first two verses of hymn 306, Fairest Lord Jesus, and hymn 377, Come to the Lake Shore.
please be seated. Our second scripture reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. The message today will be about what some Christian scholars call ecclesiology, which is just a fancy way of saying an understanding of the church. What is the church and what should the church be? And I can't think of any passage more pertinent to such a discussion than the one before us today from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Listen for the Word of God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our Lord will stand forever. When you're a minister of word and sacrament, I, I suppose you get asked certain questions all the time and get approached uh, by, with certain issues again and again. And I'm often confronted with the issue of whether or not it's possible for someone to be a Christian without going to church. I find that most of those who raise this issue are with me are, are people who certainly profess to have a belief in God. They believe in God, but who for whatever reason have chosen not to affiliate with the church. Either they grew up in church and then became disaffected or disinterested at, at some particular point in time. Sometimes uh, there are those who didn't grow up in church, but they have a yearning for a deeper spiritual relationship with a higher power that's really difficult for them to articulate and and put into categories and they really decided that church isn't the thing for them that's not the place to make the discoveries they hope to make some time ago a professor of religious sociology by the name of Wade Clark Roof described a phenomenon that he called believing without belonging believing without belonging the gist of this description of this term is the modern maybe we should say postmodern notion that a person's set of beliefs are what really matters. Not whether or not they belong to a certain institution, the right institution, namely the church. The line of thinking here is that it is enough to simply believe in God and in some way live that belief out in individually meaningful ways without having to be committed to the life of the church. To kind of go it by oneself. The idea of believing but not belonging is something that, that characterizes uh, many baby boomers, especially latter uh, baby boomers, as well as generations X and Y. Such thinking as that may seem alien to members of the so-called World War II generation who remain with us today. They grew up in a time when belonging went hand in hand with believing. It's applied not just to church life, but also to all manner of, of organizations out in the world, to social clubs and garden clubs and service clubs. Uh, the World War II generation always placed, gr placed great stock in becoming a member of whatever institution was addressing the things that they cared about. And today, many older people of that generation lament the decline of, of service organizations, social clubs, and even churches 
due to the unwillingness of younger people to join up and get involved. There is a generation gap on this matter I feel rather sure about. In order to address whether or not someone can be a Christian without going to church, we must first come to terms with what the church is in the first place. Some people see the church as a certain place. It resides in a special building on a special hallowed piece of land. It may be small and quaint. It may be majestically transcendent. It may be in the middle of Manhattan. It may be in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska. But it is the building and the setting uh, itself that, that holds deep meaning for those who see the church as a place. Such a view does hold certain benefits. A familiar place might offer us some measure of security and, and comfort in this world, this topsy-turvy world. Sitting on the pew that our great-grandmother always sat on may offer us a sense of tradition, a sense of continuity across the generations. The architecture of a building may bring our hearts to a place that somehow seems in closer proximity to God. I feel certain that many of you share such a sentiment about this very sanctuary, the very place we are in this moment, this lovely worship space with which we are so wonderfully blessed. However, the downside to seeing the church as a place is that it can produce within us a sense of insulation that has the effect of leading us to believe that this is where God resides rather than outside the doors of the church facility. If we're not careful about it, it can lead us down an idolatrous road in which we come to love the building as much as we love the person, or Jesus Christ, whom we gather to worship and serve. In a conversation years ago with a, a former church member, the issue was raised that the future of that particular congregation may well rest upon whether or not its soul and its spirit and its sense of mission is as beautiful as its buildings. I personally find this to be a quite provocative viewpoint. An important question for us to ask, so it seems to me that our seeing the church as a place does have some value but is inadequate to fully satisfy all of the things that God requires of us as Christian people. Other people see the church first and foremost as an institution. Such a point of view values the organizational handiwork that furthers the goals of ministry. It values, uh, in many cases, the public stands taken by the church for values that are deemed as holy values. It sees the church as the place where God's people uh, get organized, where we arrange and equip ourselves for task of ministry. It may well be that Presbyterians with our connectional model of church government, with our presbyteries and synods and the general assembly at the highest level, that we have a special affinity for this kind of thinking. I've actually known colleagues in ministry who seem almost giddy when they go to presbytery meetings. They seem to really relish the time spent in dealing with church politics and organizational structures. And they see our church polity as one of our great strengths, and I would agree with that. They seem to feel proud of being a part of such endeavors as being a part of a, a presbytery organization or, or whatnot. And yet the downside of this is that we can begin to love the organizational structure and the politics more than we love the things to which those things point us, namely the person of Jesus Christ. Rather than seeing the church's institutional framework as the means to an end, the means can begin to transcend the importance of the end, and this too is idolatrous. So our seeing the church as an institution has its own inherent limitations. In Matthew's Gospel, the disciples are asked by Jesus who others are saying that he is. What's the, the word on the streets, guys? And then pushing them just a little bit further, he asks who they say that he is. And it's good old Simon Peter who comes up with the right answer. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. For such a profession, Jesus praises him and gives him a new name, Peter. 
Peter meaning rock. And he proclaims that Peter is the rock upon whom the church will be built. As a lot of you, I'm sure, are well aware, some of you may not know, tradition has it that Peter is actually the very first pope in the Roman Catholic Church. He is the beginning point of a line of what's called apostolic succession that currently resides in Pope Francis, who is the uh, pope number 266. Throughout the centuries, there have been 266 popes, but it all goes back to Peter. In effect, we might say that the Christian church begins at this very moment in which Peter is named as the rock upon whom the church will be built. But take careful notice of what it is that brings all of this about. It's not so much that Jesus just had to pick someone and, and Peter seemed to be the logical candidate, or even that Peter was the most pure and holy man that Jesus knew, and so the lot fell to Peter. After all, Peter's failure of nerve would manifest itself on the night of Christ's betrayal when he denied his master three times before the new day could begin. Rather, it is the profession of faith. The profession of faith that Christ is the Son of the living God that makes all the difference. This is the thing that earns Peter his new name and established the church of Jesus Christ on the face of the earth. We are not to say, though, that the church is Peter's any more than we might say that the church is Mary's or Paul's or John Calvin's or Billy Graham's or the Pope's or yours or mine. It's not any of ours. The church is ultimately the church of Jesus Christ. He is the sole object of our authentic worship. And yet there can be no doubt that the church has an intrinsically human component. In the end, human beings are always a part of the church. After Christ ascended to sit at the right hand of God, it was left to God's people to make sure that the profession was lived out lived out in the faithful memory of Christ's teaching and His sacrifice for the sins of all humanity. The church is therefore a real mixture, a mixture, I would say, of mortality and of Holy Spirit, a unique composition of people and profession. It cannot be purely one without the other. Our Book of Order tells us that the church of Jesus Christ is a provisional demonstration of what God intends for all humanity. Of course, we know that the church is made up of sinners who make mistakes, sinners who hurt each other's feelings sometimes, who transgress the will of God over and over again. In short, the church, because it is made up of human beings, like you and me, falls continually short of what God intends for it to be. But still, it is called to a higher purpose that transcends all of its shortcomings and limitations and is blessed by God as it engages in acts of ministry. Acts of ministry that may be imperfect, but are nonetheless faithful. Our Savior Himself promises us that where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This leads us to the conclusion that the church is not best seen as a building or as an institution, but rather as the gathering of God's people. When two or three or three hundred people gather in the name of Jesus Christ, something sacred begins to happen. It is when people come together, especially those claimed and called by God to worship and serve, that we have just a little foretaste of what the heavenly kingdom is going to be like. If you don't believe me, just look around sometime. Just look around and observe the work of the church in, in all of its many dimensions, as many as you can name in your mind. See the people gathered and sitting around tables of fellowship at a covered dish supper. See them working side by side on a mission project like we did just this past Sunday afternoon. 
uh, for the, the Rise Up Against Hunger effort. See them in a time of study, exploring scripture or other topics of spiritual concern. See them in worship, in prayer, in song, in sacrament. See all of these things and you will see that the church is always inevitably about God's people coming together with Jesus Christ in the midst of them. When I was a child, I learned a simple uh, little thing that helped us to remember. I don't know if I learned this in Sunday school or somewhere else, but it went like this. It said, this is the church and this is the steeple. Open it up, and there are the people. Kind of silly. But it was a way of remembering that the church is us. It's you and me and Christian people worldwide wherever the name of Jesus Christ is spoken and lived. Back to the original question. Can a person be a Christian without going to church? I get asked that a lot, as I said. And my answer to those who ask the question is essentially this. If you believe that with God all things are possible, then maybe so. Certainly there are people who believe rather fervently in the essential tenets of the Christian faith who never once set foot in a church, who have no intention to ever set foot in a church. But what are the implications for going it alone? I think what is missed is the mutual support of prayer and word and deed. The mutual support of learning together in venues like Sunday school and Bible study. The mutual support of table fellowship. And the mutual support of worship together as the corporate body of Christ, which is what we are right here now. There is simply no substitute I know for these kinds of things. There is no place that people can go and get those kinds of things in quite the same way they can inside the church. And so I say that while it is possible for someone to walk the life of, life of faith outside the church, it seems rather unlikely given what is missed and what is so badly needed. When two or three are gathered, Peter's great profession of faith becomes real and tangible. But in isolation, it usually rem remains just good thinking, a good theory in our minds. We need the support of the community of faith, no matter how imperfect at times it may seem to be. For it is in the church that we learn best what it means to be God's people where we have an opportunity to act upon what we have learned. I think we should also acknowledge that there is something almost mystical, I would say, about the church because it has been ordained and blessed by Jesus Christ Himself. Sometimes we lose sight of that. And we think of the church as just another one of the things in life with which we affiliate, just a, another place that we go. We think of our giving in the offering plate like we think of paying our dues to uh, the country club or, or paying our bill to the power company. We think of coming here for worship or for other purposes as just another date on our calendars, just another thing to check off the list of our sometimes busy and cluttered lives. But the church is the body of Christ on this earth. We are the hands and the feet and the heartbeat of Jesus Christ Himself inasmuch as we serve Him and proclaim Him and give Him all of the glory. The church is not quite like a civic club or a school support group like the PTA or the organizations out there that are, are created to, to fight some disease or malady in our world because even though these other groups have their own importance and even though they can be holy in what they do and seek to do, it's only the church that is built upon the rock by God Almighty. It's only the church. It's only in the church that the word is clearly proclaimed and the sacraments are rightly administered. 
Church of Jesus Christ bears a light in this world that is unlike any other body. I remember hearing something I, I thought to be rather profound in the words of a woman by the name of Marge Carpenter. That name may not ring a bell with you. Marge Carpenter was the moderator of the Presbyterian Church General Assembly a little over 20 years ago. And she was an older woman from Texas who was a real straight shooter, very forthright, a wonderful personality. And her most keen interest uh, as the moderator of our, our denomination was in the field of world missions. She addressed the Presbytery of Charlotte one time and she shared many stories of mission work being done around the world and the many countries to which she had traveled to observe uh, mission sites in, in just about every continent on the face of the earth. And she wrote a lot on this topic as well, one, told wonderful stories. And she spoke uh, of a nation uh, in Eastern Europe where the communist government had tried to actually eradicate Christianity at one time. It was vehemently persecuted over an extended period of time. She said that it had cost some believers their lives and that it had caused others to fall away from their faith, but that through it all and in the aftermath of the persecution of the church once uh, it was over, that the church actually began to thrive once again and that a remnant of believers had kept the church going throughout that period of time and pers of persecution had really kept it going as something of an underground organization. And then she said this. She said that once the church of Jesus Christ is in a place, a seed of it always remains. It never disappears forever. Maybe that's another way of saying that the Word of God does not return empty. Maybe that's another way of saying that the gates of Hades will not prevail against Christ's church. The church flourishes in so many places because the church is ordained and blessed by God. We're blessed uh, here at Buford Presbyterian to have so many Presbyterians from other nations, uh, unlike any other church that I've served quite uh, in this way, and, and a significant uh, delegation of people from the nation of Cameroon who worship with us on a weekly basis. Most of those uh, that I, I know who were born in Cameroon were baptized and raised, not in the Presbyterian Church USA, but in the Presbyterian Church of Cameroon. And that is true of at least one member of our current session. And so we can see that the church is everywhere, everywhere where the name of Christ is proclaimed. And it's God's people who make that proclamation. We know that the church is made up of people who truly care, who despite their faults really attempt to put the best foot forward and exhibit care. They, we know that the church is constituted by the people that you can count on, to be a community of faith. The people who love you even in your worst moments. People who themselves are not perfect, only forgiven. The people who stand as a provisional demonstration of what God intends for all humanity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the church is us. The church is us, you and me. Amen. Let us now stand and affirm the things that we believe as the people of God, disciples of Jesus Christ, saying together the words of confession. They are from the second Helvetic confession and printed on the inside of your bulletin. Christ, the sole head of the church, it is the head which has the preeminence in the body, and from it the whole body receives life. By its spirit, the body is governed in all things. From it also the body receives increase, that it may grow up. Also there is one head of the body, and it is suited to the body. Therefore the church cannot have any head besides Christ. For as the church is a spiritual body, 
so it must also have a spiritual head in harmony with itself. Neither can it be governed by any other spirit than by the Spirit of Christ. Please be seated. The psalmist tells us that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Our lives are lived as a kind of stewardship, as a sacred trust with things given to us by God, gifts of material nature, gifts of spiritual nature. And so it is that we return now a portion of that which God has first given to us in the form of an offering.
Let us pray. Lord God, we bring these gifts, evidence of our life's labors, and we submit them for the work of your church both near and far. Lord, help us to trust in your promises that you have provided for us through the church, that the gates of Hades nor anything else will prevail against it, that we have a sacred trust from you to do the work of the church, to be the extension of Jesus Christ in this world. Lord, help us to be those who not only hear, but those who do your word. As we pray in Christ's holy and righteous name, amen. Let us now join together singing our final hymn, this morning's service, hymn number 442, The Church's One Foundation. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>